Good, thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, I know some people are trying to get here still. Uh, I hope they're not stuck at the uh, Heritage Village still from last night. Um, but thank you very much indeed for making it. 8.15 is difficult enough uh, in most places, uh, including in Davos, of course, uh, if you're trying to get up from Closters or even just get a bus or get through the, the traffic jams. But I'm really delighted that so many of you have made it, even though we have got a few empty seats. Um, and I, my duty really is to make sure that I reward the fact that you've arrived on time by starting as close to time as I can. This is designed to keep building on the Global Agenda Councils and whatever work you're doing, and for you to contribute as well. Um, it's about trying to move forward to whatever uh, conclusions you're going to come to later in the morning, and then think about where this goes uh, uh, towards Davos as well. So my job is simply, uh, as two days ago, to keep that spirit going of you being engaged, of moving forward on these critical issues, uh, give um, uh, an audit of where we've got to, but also what is still missing. Uh, even though quite a few people are not here to hear the message, they will get that message uh, later on today. Now, we're going to continue the spirit of what we did um, 48 hours ago with the electronic feed, which means that rather than you, me asking you to switch off your, your iPad, your iPhone, your Samsung, your Nokia, uh, your HTC, uh, whatever machine you've got, use it to contribute as long as it's on silent, because actually it's a great way of me understanding uh, what you're thinking, and it means I can put those ideas uh, to the panelists. Uh, we're going to be talking uh, about four areas this morning. First of all, picking up that critical area which we discussed and many of you wanted to put on the agenda, and certainly having sat in one of the councils yesterday, it remains a critical area of youth work, youth employment, the prospects for youth, but the numbers are really scary. We're going to be talking about that initially. Then catastrophic risks and uh, the post-2015 development agenda. Uh, thirdly, fiscal sustainability, particularly with reference to the euro. And finally, moving on to oceans. Now, we're not going to cover them all at the same time. Uh, what I want to do is layer it through the next hour and a quarter. But I want any ideas that you've got, and already we've got some ideas coming up. Uh, we can show you the kind of uh, areas that have already been covered in what we call the waterfall. There are some of the issues. You can see what already some of you have been saying, whether it be um, Richard Blewett right at the end, the tackling unemployment for all, forward-looking emphasis on skills and governance, the message for Europe, entrepreneurship, um, what impact will fiscal clips in the US have on the global economy? That's the kind of thing that is already on your mind, even before you came in uh, to this room. So please use that machine. It doesn't mean to say we won't be using microphones, but it's a way of me getting a sense of what's still worrying you or what work still needs to be done. And that's the spirit of the next hour and 10 minutes. I had a lot of people who started sending me, and Mike, uh, who's assisting me, uh, messages at about 10, to 10 minutes from the end of the conversation. That doesn't really make it very easy for me. So if you've got an idea, send it quickly. And of course, I can come to you as well uh, with a microphone. And we've also got some of the global shapers here. The next generation, I want to hear from them as well. And just because you haven't asked a question or put an issue, it doesn't mean to say uh, I won't come to you. It's about a conversation uh, this time of the morning, even in a slightly formal setting like this. So, four areas. Uh, please uh, send your thoughts as soon as possible. Let's um, move on uh, initially with Charlotte Petri Gornitska. Uh, your view, please, uh, on uh, youth unemployment. You've been uh, chairing the Council on Youth Unemployment. Seven billion and growing the numbers. Um, where are the jobs? Where is the employment going to come from? Where is the work going to come from in future? Thank you for that very, very um, simple question to answer early in the morning. Uh, I can tell you that uh, we need you uh, to pay attention, take action and uh, provide ideas because uh, we know there are solutions. We are optimistic, but we cannot be naive. And this is an issue which we cannot discuss as a future issue. Uh, this is a pressing issue here today. Let's not talk about young people being the future and tomorrow, because this is a problem that has to be dealt with now. Uh, half of the world's population is under 27 years old. 
many are unemployed. One of the problems is that we in the council, we actually don't believe that we have uh, the facts right yet. Uh, because we know that the problem is all over. Uh, we know that there is large figures in sub-Saharan Africa as well as in my country, Sweden, which may surprise you. We know that this issue is in a way a global issue. Some of the solutions may be similar, but the context and the prerequisites are different. So yes, there are ideas, yes, there are solutions, but what the council has, has concluded is that we need to realize that we need to create jobs. We need the business sector to take not only responsibility, but really see this as a responsibility and an investment, not corporate social responsibility on the side, but core to what's needed for the future. But apprenticeship and jobs fixed by the business sector is one part of the solution, but we really need to create jobs. So for that reason, we need to more long-term work with how we educate young people all over the world. We need to build in transferable skills, soft skills, entrepreneurial skills in the curriculum. We need young people today that are already up and running, being the world's best entrepreneurs, to get your ideas out there, because we need immediate action as well. We need businesses to take action today. Vocational training, we left that 15 years ago. I'm ashamed that we did that, actually. We really need good trainers focusing on vocational training now. Our council has decided to try to work on kind of three levels to inspire change. One is concrete actions where we want to improve models for entrepreneurship, models for apprenticeship, and spread them. But we also know that it takes so much more than good ideas and good examples. We need systemic change. We need business to be able to, to operate. We need young entrepreneurs to be able to operate. So we need policy on country levels. So we need country plans where government, business, education, NGOs, and the stakeholders to come together and really decide on a strategy and implement that a little bit more long term. So the council is modeling how to create country plans. The, the council is also trying to, to see in what way can we influence uh, the global policy where it's needed. And one of the things we want to do is to take the opportunity of the future Millennium Development Goals and focus on jobs, jobs creation, and what has to be measured in the education system to really make education bridge to jobs. Uh, so we have a lot to do, and we know that there's a lot of attention around the issue, but I... I I think we are in a place where we have recognized the problem. I, th I also hear some pessimism. We might, we won't succeed if we are pessimistic. We must take action, be optimistic, not naive. But, and we cannot discuss this problem as a problem of tomorrow because it's actually the case that young people in Many years from now, we will have a lot of young people in Africa and, and Southeast Asia. Uh, but the problem we are discussing are young people now. And if young people are excluded, not part of the society, not co-creating the society, a lot of the other things that we will discuss on the panel today will be even worse than the, how we foresee those problems today. Good. All right, thank you. Now, uh, Beatrice, Celine, and Valerie, do you want to come in at, po at any point on this? Please do. There are plenty of, of people in the audience as well. But let me just pick up on this, and we've just heard about development goals as well, Valerie, so maybe you would like to pick up on this. But there are some um, global uh, shapers here, and I'd like, can you get a microphone to the front, please? Let's just pick up with, with your thoughts. Please get the microphone. Who's got the microphone? Two microphones. Uh, Vida, let's go to, from Mumbai, uh, and also, um, uh, Nafez as well, please. Is this the kind of thing which you believe? You'll come from Mumbai. There are major stresses there, big urban stresses as well. Is this the kind of language you want to hear? Yeah. 
Uh, I believe that uh, 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 the job creation, yes, it's required for the youth because uh, right now the number says that close to 200 million people are unemployed uh, uh, this, by end of 2012 and uh, another 200 million uh, earn less than $2 uh, uh, a year, a day. So which is kind of 400 million is, is the number that we're talking about. And the only way to, uh, to, uh, to bridge this, uh, this uh, to create job is, is to, br to bridge the gap between what industry uh, requires and what actually the academic output is today. So currently I'm working on a certain uh, pro programs which actually uh, addresses this gap. I should just ask you, Charlotte, you talked about creating jobs. Is it jobs or work? It's both. Uh, because we, we, we believe that uh, uh, we, we need young people, not only young people, we need people to uh, innovate and build business themselves. And obviously that is job creation for themselves and hopefully others. But we also need businesses, already big businesses, to provide work. Uh, we want to move young people from the informal sector to the formal sector. All right, well, let me, so, let me pick up on, on that because I'd like to introduce you to Nafez Dakak. Uh, you're 23. You're about to go to Jordan where part of the job you're going to have is about creating work, jobs, uh, and new forms of employment. When you hear that kind of language, you hear the kind of discussion here. You're age 23. Are you optimistic or not? I don't know if I'm optimistic. I'm probably not pessimistic, but there are a lot of problems and a lot of systematic problems that we need to talk about. I love that you mentioned vocational training. I mean, I consider myself the education guy. I'm a huge fan of education, learning, reading. And indeed, your card says, I'm the education guy. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> uh, however, I think one, we have this whole, uh, I think Sir, Sir Ken Robinson talked about in his TED talk, education inflation. You used to need a bachelor's degree, you were guaranteed a job, now you need a master's, and in some cases a PhD. So this emphasis on vocational training and trying to find pathways to work that start maybe sometimes in high school, and also understanding that with serial mastery, which is the fact that the skills needed in the job market change very regularly, you don't need one career path. So I think something I'd like us maybe to talk about or to hear more about is how are we going to prepare people to become more self-learners, more motivated, how do we create that motivation? But do you feel that minds here are gripped by the enormity of the challenge, not for a few years from now, but a few months and a few weeks? Unfortunately, no. I mean, I think, I don't know if Professor David Bloom is here, but one thing he talked about uh, is the demographic dividend. And we talk a lot about 100 million youth in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And we usually talk about that as a threat and as a challenge. But if you look at the East Asian countries, one thing that really worked for them is in terms of timing, they use that demographic dividend really well to spur their economies and move them forward. So my question is how many years or how many months or what's the time frame in the Middle East that we need to capitalize on that opportunity? And that's the biggest thing that scares me. Charlotte, the time frame. Yeah, well, I, very, uh, now. <laughs> and that, and that's, it's a very simple answer, but I, 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 we really need to fix this problem very quickly and focus all attention on it because we can see that the figures are increasing all the time and we know that the, these young people that we are talking about, they are old in 10 years from now or older. So let's say five, five to 10 years, but that takes immediate action to even talk about that time frame. A question here from uh, Vladimir Vagola, number nine, Abdul. Um, can the strategic investments to training of specific skills um, one moment, I pressed the wrong button there. Can the strategic investments to training of specific skills for companies change the situation with unemployment? It's up there. It's part uh, of the problem, or the solution rather. Uh, yes, uh, if, if we take one example, uh, we have companies that are... Uh, they bring their own people into a country where they operate because of lack of skills in country. Uh, and that creates a problem short term and long term. You, and if a company, instead of bringing Swedes to another country, uh, if they invest now in educating people in the country they operate, uh, mechanics being what, whatever work we're talking about, if they do that now, they will create jobs for young people who need them in their own country. And they can do that now. We have many examples of that. Uh, but it's not, it's, there are still the benchmarks and good examples. We need many more of those.
Right. Nick, you, can, Nick, can I make a point here? Please do, yes, um, Valerie. Uh, because one of the things that came up in uh, one of the uh, discussions I was in yesterday was uh, a very clear statement that whilst we have a global economy, we don't have a global community. And I think that when we talk about these issues of employment and unemployment, we have systems and structures between countries for example, with respect to issues of migration and so on, mm. which actually constrain the ability to move. That's so true. Whilst we have a global economy mm. that actually requires movement, skill development mm. and so on. So there are some bigger issues yes. here mm. that we have to address if we are really going to fundamentally get to the heart of this mm. issue with respect to youth unemployment globally. I think that really has to be put very yeah. firmly on the agenda and I yeah. don't see it there and I heard the same discussion and it seems to me the very radical potential solution even with yeah. all the electoral hang-ups about migration. Let's take a few more issues. The, the deal is here. We finish at 9.30. As I said, we're layering, we're scaling it. So I'm going to put a cap on this discussion of another five minutes and then move on to the other panellists as well so everyone gets a fair hearing. At the back, please. Microphone. I'm Timothy Ma from Hong Kong. Uh, I'm not a young unemployer, but I am aging because I see the market is out there, the growing emerging demand on elderly care, of which provide a lot of opportunities to the young people. So I think this is a challenge and opportunity. In reverse, the young people, you know, the highest unemployment rate in Hong Kong is the young people who are not due to the undersupply of uh, vacancies, but due to their hidden young people characters that they hide in their home and enjoy the web world and even have no motivation to come out to work. And secondly, they also think that elder care work is a dirty job. So they try them, themselves not to be linked up with. But I see there is a lot of opportunities because the, a, the globe is aging and the demand on elder care is also there. So I think we should link up the young people with the old people to create the intergeneration uh, employment. Thank you. Thank you. Let me put several of the uh, things which have been raised here, Charlotte, and also for the rest of the panel, if you want to come in, not least because there are fiscal implications as well. Number 17, Jennifer McNelly. What role in youth development programs like the global skills competitions play in youth uh, employment? Uh, Rajendra Good. Gupta, education needs to be redefined and transformed into skill education. Uh, Esther Dyson, number 15. Esther, you've sent two messages here. Education, again, is the key to solving every problem on the list. Adding in number 12, Abdul, what is a scalable startup, one that can survive the departure of its founder and that generates more value than it consumes? How can we ensure that more enterprises make this leap, presumably, um, into employment as well? So that's the kind of thread emerging in the discussion uh, and the, the views from the, the audience, Charlotte. Well, I think uh, we all need to recognize that uh, education is key, yes. Uh, and we have talked about that. We need to think through how, this edu how we build in uh, for, in, for instance, entrepreneurship skills early in education, how we uh, work with transferable soft skills and all of that. That is researched. We know that. It will take some time before curriculums are changed. So that's why the, com the immediate combination of vocational training and the business uh, action uh, is needed now to do a bit of that, to fill the gap that is there today. Knowing that we do have more kind of global issues to deal with at the same time. Uh, I think that we need the business sector to commit uh, a bit more than we, that we, what we hear and see. Uh, I expect and hope that the World Economic Forum will do its job there uh, because the World Economic Forum can really get the attention from the business sector and I really think that we need a much more clearer commitment from the business sector in dealing with this issue. Interesting. Uh, Rajendra Gupta c came back and said, do we need a, a, new, a new WEF, a World Employment Forum? <laughs> Valerie, building on your yeah. point about the big deal. Well, I think that we need the ideas, talents, skills, experience of the people who are engaged uh, in WEF 
to be thinking around these issues um, uh, on employment. I don't think I would want to pull it out and separate it because I think one of the things that has become clear or is clear is that there is an interconnectedness between mm. the youth unemployment or employment agenda and so many other areas, including uh, education, uh, including uh, global developments, what's happening in the financial sector and so on. So I wouldn't want to pull it out and separate it, but I do think we need to integrate it mm. into the broader discussions that we're having. Yeah. All right. Uh, is, can we just have the microphone with the global shapers again? Uh, let's go to Neda al-Mubarak from uh, Saudi Arabia. Your view, listening to this discussion, you're from the Investment Authority. Does this fill you with a degree of optimism that things are moving, <laughs> particularly the urgency? Absolutely. I mean, um, just hearing, you know, all the discussion over the past couple of days, um, I think we sometimes forget to take a step back and realize that, you know, people really are working on this issue. Um, if I can just add one idea, I would just say that uh, many countries around the world are, are kind of um, wanting to attract foreign investment and just promote different investment opportunities. Um, one big idea is to just work more with these um, with these big companies, the Googles of the world, um, and just try to understand what are the skills that they need and then go back and work with the public sector um, in, and try to infiltrate the curriculum with those skills. So that's something, as a global shaper, this is you know, something that I'm very passionate about and something that we're trying to work on as well. Thank you, Nedra. And let's uh, hear from Yaman El Hajja, who's 28, uh, sitting alongside you. <clears throat> I, I like the points made um, with the skills being brought to the classroom because I do agree that uh, often there's a mismatch in between the skills that are needed for the job, which is why a lot of people are out of, um, are out of employment. And I agree with the practical approach. So yes, changing curriculum um, in the classroom, but also having a practical kind of um, on-the-job training from an earlier age. We usually think of um, co-ops or internships as a college kind of activity. We don't think of it in a younger, uh, at a younger age. And I think just being in a professional environment there are things that will, um, you know, pay back in the long term uh, as, these, uh, as these young um, students get into the workplace. They've learned from uh, practical on-the-job training um, away from the classroom, but even before they actually get into, you know, university or the later uh, stages of career. Excellent. Thank you. And Mark Spellman uh, from Accenture, a real problem is quality of teachers. They're not keeping up to speed with the fast-changing job market. We need to look at excellence in teaching. At that point, I'm going to sort of cap the discussion, but Charlotte, you're just nodding there, agreement. No, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, I mean, we, we, uh, we know that when we look into the education system and what works, the teacher is at core, uh, obviously. And uh, we also discussed in our council that uh, if, we are, if we are truly believing in uh, entrepreneurship and apprenticeship, we need to train the trainers and all of that. So it's really, really important. And again, it's so linked. We cannot talk about un unemployment without education and without realizing that it's part of a bigger problem. So, but knowing that, we also need to start to be practical and, and talk to each other uh, on all these levels, and I think that's where I'm, with hard work, I'm optimistic that we can do that. Beatrice, I'm gonna to come to you on fiscal sustainability in a moment, but on this issue alone. Yes, I think uh, one thing I would like to add to this uh, tragedy of youth unemployment, which is particularly pronounced in, the, in Europe right now, where we have this, uh, of course, there is a, there is a bit of a measurement uh, question. We measure unemployment very precisely, and. But, you know, according to all numbers, uh, youth unemployment in many European countries is now at absolutely high, uh, record high levels. So, uh, but one of the good news about this is, however, that, you know, things are happening that uh, uh, could make labor markets in the future um, more uh, flexible because these, these young people are actually reacting. Um, they are trying to, you know, find ways how to move their learning, their learning languages, you know, one of the main obstacles within Europe for moving. And I think what we need to think about is more also what are the type of policies that can support this, that can support if, if there is at the moment you, not likely, uh, high likelihood of finding a job at the place where you happen to live, but there is a good likelihood of finding it some few hundred miles further uh, 
you know, in another, in another country that is, however, part of the same uh, European Union, then these opportunities should be taken now. And I think thinking about policies that lower the obstacles to migration uh, could also be something that is not only part of the solution, but uh, of the short one solution, but also makes, the, makes, uh, the, the, makes Europe ultimately more integrated in the long run. I think this is a very important big idea which seems to be emerging, which we, we're going to have to f uh, hold for a moment, if you don't mind, or uh, certainly for the next few minutes, because uh, in fairness to all three of you who haven't spoken really fully yet, um, I want to move on. And uh, we've got a lot of other points being made on uh, youth mm -hmm. employment and unemployment and generation of work. And I might come back to that closer to 9.30. But let's uh, move on uh, with uh, Valerie Amos, Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator a modest title you have there, a modest number of challenges. But um, in three or four minutes, Valerie, your summary of the catastrophic risks and the risks being faced, but particularly in the framework of 2015, and what happens after that? Well, Nick, thank you very much. And I mean, we've been discussing in the Catastrophic uh, Risk uh, Council, particularly that uh, as a world, we're not just facing challenges with respect to natural disasters and conflict, but we also need to think about issues, for example, around uh, cyber security, uh, nuclear proliferation and so on. And what we have is uh, a world system, a global system which has developed over time, uh, which is tried and tested, but which isn't necessarily uh, flexible enough uh, to deal with these major and deepening crises. All the data shows that with uh, climate change, uh, with uh, environmental degradation, with the rise in population in some parts of the world, deepening uh, food insecurity, that we have some major challenges that cannot be tackled just by the system as it is uh, currently framed. And we can learn some of the lessons from the way that uh, the development goals have been uh, used. Uh, there's a degree of optimism, I think, around some of the global health issues and what has been achieved over the last 10 years. We focus very much on the things that still need to be done, but I, I share Charlotte's uh, optimism that there are some things that we need to uh, celebrate in terms of the progress that we've made. So measuring things and having a constituency that pushes uh, the international community to actually deliver on its promises is absolutely uh, critical. <clears throat> Building a much better and stronger partnership uh, between national governments, the international communities, and the private sector is critical. Mm -hmm. Clarifying who can do what best, how can we learn uh, the lessons uh, from that, and how can we really shake up uh, our system so that we are utilizing the expertise and the experience that exists at both the national and global level? How do we help countries, households and communities to better respond to shock? We should be ashamed that we still have parts of the world that fall into famine every couple of years. To deal with that, we should be building the resilience of households and communities to withstand those shocks. We know that there are parts of the world where there's going to be drought and that there are going to be floods every year or every couple of years. How can we prepare more effectively? How can we support those communities and countries in that preparation? How crucially can we fund it? Only 4% of official development assistance is spent on preparedness as opposed to response. It is much more expensive in terms of the cost of human lives to respond after a disaster rather than to prepare for one and to help communities uh, to deal with it. Uh, so these are uh, transformational issues that we need to discuss. Uh, we need not just our catastrophic uh, council to deal with this, but we need uh, the thinking, the expertise of the other councils within uh, WEF uh, to really help us to grasp these issues and to forge what we think should be a new, more inclusive system that really brings the humanitarian response and the development community more closely together. 
You spend a lot of time talking to senior ministers right up to prime ministers and presidents about this challenge. What are your reflections now, you're well into the job, of the capacity of leadership to understand the scale of what you're putting on their table and their agenda and to deal with it, not shift it to one side and say, we'll only deal with it when it happens? Well, I think that uh, uh, our leaders are so overwhelmed with... Uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, management of crises, be they uh, economic or otherwise, uh, political. And uh, remember that I'm dealing with uh, political uh, as well as uh, disasters all of the time, that I think the kind of leadership that is required uh, is not necessarily being seen across the world. I think that there is much more a focus on, you know, how do we manage our way out of this particular crisis when what we need is a longer-term uh, vision, a longer-term political uh, vision uh, from uh, our leadership across the world. And I don't think that we are necessarily seeing that at this point in time. But what, uh, does, what, what does the political class face then? I mean, you can't go around training presidents and prime ministers. They've been through the system of being elected or being appointed. I mean, they are in that position. Yet they, as you say, are often overwhelmed. And also the civil servants too, who are serving them. But I think that one of the crucial things that we look for from our, our political leadership, and I've been a politician myself, I'm now an international civil servant, but I think that one of the things that we look for from our, our, our politicians is actually to help us to deal with the challenges that we face as individuals and really helping us to understand uh, the, the, the daily uh, difficulties that, that, that we face. And what can happen, and I think that the discussion that uh, was held on this stage two days ago, said that there's been a, a, a treat, retreat into uh, nationalism, partly because our leaders have not been able to put their heads above the parapet and actually help the people in, those, uh, in their countries to deal with the impact of uh, globalization. And Pascal Lamy said, the tank is almost empty when it comes to ideas and also cash. And I think, but I think that's what we're looking for. We're, we're looking for our leaders to put their heads uh, above the, uh, the parapet um, a little bit. Not everybody is going to um, accept uh, that leadership, that vision, but we are looking uh, for more than just a day-to-day -day management of crises. We're looking uh, to, to our leadership to actually help us to think about what is our world going to look like, what kind of contribution can uh, we make, and to really hear the voices of uh, the people, not just in their countries, but more globally as well. I'm not saying that this is an easy thing uh, to do. I mean, we talked this morning about uh, migration and issues of immigration. I have a huge concern. Uh, I'm European. I come from the United Kingdom. I have a huge concern at the way that we in the European Union are looking at issues of uh, immigration. If you look at uh, the numbers of re uh, refugees and displaced people around the world and where they end up, believe you me, they don't end up in the European Union. They end up in other countries which are already challenged in terms of their development and so on. Uh, you look at countries like uh, Tanzania on, uh, uh, on the African continent with year after year have welcomed in refugees from neighboring countries. We have to change the nature of this debate and it requires strong political leadership to actually help people in countries to understand this. Let's get a few ideas. Um, do you want to talk on this particular subject? Uh, th thank you. I'm Menaz Aziz from uh, Pakistan, and I would like to draw uh, attention towards our uh, um, uh, leaders and the state of education in Pakistan. Um, that, uh, you know, the leaders have vested interests, they come from, from feudal class, etc., and they are not able to fulfill the demand of the people in terms of quality education for all. So we have a huge bulk of uh, young, uneducated, and unemployed uh, youth. Uh, both men and women who have been and more so growing and illiterate mother wanting their children to go to school where there are no quality schools available and children coming into schools and fifth graders not even being able to uh, pass a first uh, grade test. 
So, um, you know, are we going to miss the boat? Are we going to be part of global social responsibility? Because deeper engagement is required and it is beyond that of our leaders. It is uh, an engagement with the communities because for these young, uneducated and unemployed, terrorism is a possible uh, employment. Right, so what you're doing is actually making a link between what Charlotte was saying about employment and jobs and what Valerie has been saying about uh, uh, risk as well. Do you see that connection, all of you? And please, Celine and Beatrice, do come in on this discussion because it does impact on, on your areas as well, the issue of leadership and leaders understanding what is needed, not in 10 years, but in 10 months maybe. Valerie. Well, I think it's, um, uh, I think there's a crucial um, uh, point in that question, which is if you don't have the national leadership that is helping to support the investment in things like education, what is our responsibility as a global community? And I don't think that we have uh, an easy answer uh, to this, uh, and how we deal with it is not uh, consistent, uh, because of course we have to uh, make sure that we respect uh, national sovereignty and uh, national uh, boundaries, but at the same time, I think we have uh, a responsibility as a global community, particularly as we have a set of Millennium Development Goals which are focusing on uh, issues around uh, universal education, maternal health, the eradication of poverty and so on. How do we encourage governments that aren't necessarily themselves putting the resources into areas like education, which we see as being uh, critical uh, and which I do think uh, is crucial uh, for the longer term uh, health of the world uh, community, uh, not just in terms of uh, minimizing the risks to, in, uh, to individual communities, but in terms of creating uh, greater global opportunity, if you like. How do we encourage that? And I don't think that we necessarily have the levers at our disposal to do that. And I think that the push has got to be bottom up rather than top down. And I think that within Pakistan itself, some of the bravery that we're seeing with young people who are uh, pushing the importance of uh, education, young women who are saying uh, education is important for our development, how we support those movements from outside is critical. No more than five minutes on this, but let me put to you what Chloe Longevin, Longevin says. A new model of leadership for catastrophic risk is to actively mobilize actors from multiple stakeholders and business leaders alike. And Jennifer McNally has reminded us what we were talking about in a number of interventions two days ago about this complex relationship between local, regional, and global. All of you, again, not least because of fiscal sustainability as well, this balance, have you come away from the last two days with a clarity on this issue of, uh, of regional, local, and international as well? Valerie, Charlotte? Well, it's going, it's going to be different depending on what the particular situation is. I don't think that there is any one model that uh, I would say will work in every single situation. But I would certainly say if you're looking specifically at uh, disaster risk, if you're looking at you know, what might happen if there is a, a flood or a, a drought, you have to start at the uh, household and community level. You have to work at that at the same time as you're looking at national and regional institutions. You have to work on both. Beatrice. Well, you know, I, I just, on this uh, question of local, regional, or global, I, I would very much agree with Pascal Lamy's uh, initial statement that the energy, not only the cash and ideas, but the political energy for the global uh, level solutions when it comes to establishing new institutions or rules is very, very low and is, uh, has been uh, decreasing over the last few years rather than increasing. And that's the one thing, the one most worrying thing, and of course it concerns not only catastrophic risk, it concerns a variety of uh, problems. The one thing that we, we really, and where I think a community like the Global Economic Forum and the G Global Agenda Council can make a difference, because it's not bottom up, it's not fully, um, fully top down, but somewhere in between, where actually people like us can make a dif uh, difference in calling for this and pointing out this lack of global uh, institution building and will to do so that is uh, emerging. You've got the microphone. 
I am heading an international organization in Vienna. We are dealing with nuclear weapon tests, tsunamis, and earthquakes, and the Fukushima type of conflict. And your name testing. is? My name is Tibor Toth. The point I would like to make, it, make is the following. We will need force multipliers. Force multipliers as communities, international organizations, business community and academia. They are separated, too many wars. Within the international organizations, we have to change the way we operate. 2.0 operating system we need. To give you one example, we as organizations are sitting on data, we are sitting on information, on potential knowledge. We have to share it, globally sharing organizations instead of intergovernmental organizations. How we can do it? And let me throw a challenge here. In the last three years, we started what we call as well massive open online courses. Each year we managed to double the number of participants. Right now we have four times the size of the organization. In the UN intergovernmental organization system, it would mean that in a year we could train half a million people. There is no reason why next year we couldn't even double again. One million people, there are skills. We have to bring in new, no new notions of incubators. Incubators where we really pull together business, academia, and intergovernmental organizations. We have to change how education is approached. This is a 1,000 years old institution. Instead of curriculum, moving to professions and moving to jobs, we have to turn around uh, the whole issue. Okay. So a challenge there, in the UN system, we can train in a year, one million people if we use force multipliers. Wow, you're talking about a massive recalibration there. Let's get a couple more views, please, here and then there, and then we'll go back to the panel, then Beatrice and Celine as well on their particular interventions. Yeah, this is Rajendra Gupta. Uh, see, uh, centuries back, you know, when we had Darwin, who was a sailor, and, you know, we had Newton, who saw apple falling and came with the laws, which people have not even dwelled more on. So I think the education system was not there previously, but people used to think about future and they could see things as naturally as they could. I think we have become more theoretical now and degrees don't create jobs. I mean, most of us sitting here have not used our basic degrees to be here, but our experience. I think that should throw a big challenge to our system. You see major school dropouts who created billion dollar companies and millions of jobs. I think they have slapped the education system today. So we need to actually look at that. All right, let's, let's pause on jobs for a moment because we're talking about uh, what Valerie was talking about with um, the enormity there. Over, there are two here. Who, who was further back? Who's got the microphone further back? Maybe not. Okay, please. Good morning. Uh, Just picking up on Valerie for the moment, please, in th this section, rather than talking about jobs, because I, I yeah, can yeah. go back to that. I mean, um, my, I'm, my name is Ibrahim Tadros. I'm from the, uh, I'm global chair from the Dubai Hub. My question is, it would be great if we have, I mean, even if we have very efficient institutions doing grassroots operations, post-trauma or post-disasters. But I think, I mean, one of the main big elephants in the room is the current governance structure of world organizations. They're very handicapped by the way they're structured to be able to make decisions before it's a crisis. Like when it first starts, Syria is a good example. It's still going on. Uh, or the famine in Sudan. I mean, there's, it's a governance structure. So do you see that the world will come together at some point in the future to be able to change this governance structure to get humankind to a better place. All right, that, that's an important question. Valerie first, then Beatrice and, and Celine, because this, this impact on those other areas of the fiscal area and also obviously with oceans and, and the Arctic and so on. Valerie, first of all, you. I think that the, the governance issue um, uh, needs to be addressed in the sense of the political, the political context in which we work. So we have a United Nations, we have a, a, a Security Council, for example, that's very focused on looking at issues of, of peace and security uh, around the world. We have a separate system that is dealing with humanitarian, uh, which overlaps uh, in certain areas, a separate system looking at uh, development. Yes, we do need to bring uh, those together more effectively at the global level, but at the same time, I think that the issues around governance structures in nation states is also critical. Uh, I'm very often trying to work with governments that don't even want to admit that they have a humanitarian crisis. Uh, I went to Syria in March and the Syrian authorities were telling me that there was no issue in Syria 
There were over a million people at that time who were displaced. It's much, much worse now. So uh, there is a real issue uh, that faces us as an international community when we can see that there is a problem in a nation state, what are the levers that we have to really support the people in that country if their own government is not prepared to do that? And this is not just in relation to conflict, violence, issues around the protection of uh, civilians, which are critical. It is also an issue in terms of the development uh, arena. If a country is making decisions about putting more resources, I don't know, for example, into defense rather than, uh, this is a very obvious example, rather than education and, and health, uh, they may well say uh, uh, to, to their citizens that uh, our priority is your security. Their citizens might have a different, uh, different view. So these are issues that I think that we will continue to struggle with. I don't think that our international governance system is right because it was established uh, a long time ago, but I still think that there will be uh, some really tricky issues and problems that we will not be able to resolve. Charlotte, quickly. Quickly, uh, I represent um, a governmental agency, Sweden, and we are a big donor. We also have to think through the way that we act in the future. Uh, going away from grants to big systems, to solutions uh, which embraces more, many more actions, uh, actors. We have to combine uh, loans, guarantees, new financial tools, which le leads to more sustainable solutions and responsibility by other actors than the donor. And there are a lot of rethinking that we as donors need to do because we are not entering a donor recipient future. Uh, it's about partnerships, so we need to rethink the way we do things, which I am very much looking forward to because I think it's part of the kind of respectful dialogue that we need for the future. Thank you. We're doing a number of handbrake turns here, so um, let's move on to fiscal sustainability and then oceans. And thanks for your patience, but I can, you can see where the dynamic and the, the, the energy has been so far. So um, Beatrice, uh, let's hear your views, particularly um, uh, your own engagement in the Euro. Uh, you're a former economist for the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, but on this issue of fiscal sustainability. Yes, um, we've spent the last two days, but of course not only the last two days, um, uh, discussing and thinking hard about this grand challenge, as it has co been called, you know, of fiscal sustainability. And of course the challenge is that, uh, that there is actually fiscal unsustainability in uh, most places. Uh, of the world, and and yet the challenge for me is to that you know I've also been asked by the organisers to please you know be inspiring and put some kind of you know more cheerful <laughs> message uh, um, at this uh, at this early hour. Um, so let me let me try to combine the two of them a bit. Um, so we we actually we started out with the US. Um, so the US, uh, the, the, the short message there is, uh, could be summarized as, it's worse than you think when you look at the long run, but it's um, maybe less uh, dramatic than you think in the short run. So we're talking about two concepts. One is the long run uh, fiscal gap, uh, which, uh, in, which uh, comprehends not only the existing deficits and debt, but also the promises that are made within the existing social security, healthcare systems, etc., that is, is the comprehensive measure of what actually uh, will have to eventually be consolidated uh, in order to be fiscally sustainable. Well, that fiscal gap is bigger than you think. And that's, uh, that was one of the uh, strong messages that came from, you know, our one of our council uh, members, uh, Larry Kotlikov, who is sort of, you know, the grandfather of fiscal sustainability measurement and uh, and uh, uh, or godfather, I should say, uh, of um, uh, this this whole area uh, and has basically introduced this to the world. So the fiscal gap in the U.S., according to his numbers, is something in the area of 12% of GDP. So that is how much consolidation would have to be done. That's, that's of course, is a very large number. Um, but then moving to the more short one, which is what a lot of people are most worried about right now because, we are, because it's imminent, and that's the fiscal cliff. 
Well, um, I mean, I've been sitting in many, many di uh, discussions about the fiscal cliff, and there, uh, the, uh, the people are quite scared that uh, the U.S. may actually go off this cliff. This, uh, remember, is just the fact that uh, there are automatic large spending cuts and weight, uh, and uh, revenue tax increases that kick in if nothing is done. If the Congress cannot agree on a, on a. Uh, compromise uh, solution, then by next year there is about 4% of GDP that come automatically off the deficit. And the question is how harmful is this not only for the US but also for the rest of the world. And the, the message there seems to be, according to you know, the experts uh, in, in our council, that um, that may not be as bad as you think. Yes, it would, I mean, if we go off the cliff and nothing is done, you have a big contribution already to consolidation, so you're solving the longer run problem. Um, and the short run problem would be probably a recession for, for a few quarters, but not the kind of dramatic and catastrophic um, scenario that uh, some people have um, in their minds. Um, now, let me move on to the uh, to the euro uh, area or to Europe, which is the second uh, large uh, issue that we spend our time on and uh, that uh, I guess everybody spends their time on. Um, if, they, you know, if you want to or not, that is certainly one of the, <laughs> the things that are very much on the top of everybody's mind. So here, here how does the short, long run, run, long run uh, situation look like? Um, well, in terms of you know the short run instability, there is a there is a consensus that uh, you know for the moment the the measures that have been put in place by the European Central Bank in particular, but also by governments by by announcing right steps in in the direction of a banking union, have actually led to a substantial stabilisation of the of the situation and uh, this is the moment also to um, not only think about making this a, a long, uh, a, a stable um, uh, equilibrium in the financial area, but also to think about the long run uh, um, visions for the fiscal and other uh, future architecture of Europe and in particular of the Eurozone. So let me uh, talk about one thing in particular that we discussed and that I think is the one, the one issue that really uh, the, the, there is a need to um, have much, much more clear understanding of what type of future should be uh, proposed. Because remember, this is an absolutely unique situation. There is a, a large region of the world that is sort of um, um, almost like a... I'm not saying like a newborn, but you know, there is a future to shape which can be, look very different from the present architecture. And the particular question that is being asked, and um, we had the discussion of the person who is uh, working with uh, one of the four presidents, I don't know if you're aware, but there, were four, there is a report by four presidents um, of, uh, of Europe, and, and you know, if you're not from Europe, you will think, oh, and you've know, just been following the U.S. elections, you may think, oh, why do they have four presidents, you know, of, uh, of the uh, Union? Well, this is the president of the European Council, of the European Commission, of the uh, European Central Bank, and of the Eurogroup. So, this is Europe, so we have four presidents. They are all called presidents, but they work together. <laughs> um, again, this being Europe, they produce a joint report, and what, what they're thinking about very hard is the question, what should the future fiscal structure of uh, Europe look like? In particular, how much of a central budget do you need, and what do you need it for? So um, one of the things that I think many, many people are not aware of is that right now the European uh, Union has a very, very tiny uh, uh, joint budget. It's 1% of GDP, whereas, of course, you know, most countries have something in the area of 40% of GDP that, uh, that they collect uh, and, and spend. So, so the question is, would you need more and for what type of... Um, what type of uh, shocks, what type of... Uh, um, what type of problems uh, would you need more fiscal capacity? I think that's uh, very, very, fiscal capacity is being called. How much more centralization of the budget, how much more integration do you need in Europe for this region to be not only right now, but you know, a long-term stable region that also offers the right growth opportunities um, and the right kind of insurance mechanisms for this kind of crisis not to reoccur. 
And I think this challenge is not only to our council the major, a major challenge, it's also one that goes well beyond this council and you know, can be um, addressed uh, for many different areas, but you know, I think in many of your councils may also, might also play a role. Can I ask you to somehow categorize when you say that there's a fear that the US will fall off the cliff? Do you sense that everyone will stand on the edge of the cliff, look over, and walk back? Or will they, like Felix Baumgartner, jump from a high level and somehow <laughs> land safely and make a career out of it and do it rather successfully? I mean, I'm not being facetious here, but you can fall off cliffs and actually do it rather successfully, as he's proven. Okay, it's not a fiscal cliff. But is there that sense that the American economy will fall over that cliff or not? Well, the, there is a sense, um, so, uh, some people or many people seem to attribute by now a high probability that you know, there is not an agreement before the date, so in that sense you go off the cliff, but uh, that then something will be done to at least pull back some part of the reaction. So uh, there'll be so a rewinding of the video and everyone will end up back uh, on the top in, of the cliff. From a different, part, from a different start, you know, once taxes have gone up, you start discussing whether you can you know, have a compromise in lowering taxes and that is much a more appetizing uh, type of discussion than the one that whether you are increasing taxes. So although you know, it's maybe semantics, it matters. <laughs> Nick, uh, Nick, can I just ask very quickly, I mean, if they did fall off the cliff, what are the implications for the world economy as opposed to for the US economy specifically? Indeed, Jennifer McNally asked the same question as Valerie. What impact will fiscal clips in the US have on the global economy? Well, according to this, this um, to, to the, the presentation that we also had in our uh, in our council, and uh, according to these um, you know models, the uh, impact if you fall off the cliff and nothing is done, which is not which is not mm. what we're thinking now, then uh, the, the U.S. could go into a small recession, and you know that would mean that growth would be slightly negative. Um, you'd have a difference between you know the baseline projection now and what you would have in the area of one and a half to two percent touch points of GDP less growth. Now this has of course uh, this has of course implications for the rest of the world. So for China for instance the estimate is that would that would since the linkage is quite high that could you know mean like one percent less growth. But of course you know the rest of the world also has ways of dealing with that. So there would be some reaction there. So, um, that, so that's why I said, you know, the, the, the relatively good news uh, is uh, that it may not be such a huge cliff as, uh, as uh, some people are fearing. And, you know, let's, let's not forget, it, it would be an opportunity to close some of that long-term gap, which, you know, a long-term gap is, is what it really means is that we are taxing our children, that we are making our next, uh, the children and their grandchildren poor. Uh, Pavel Svoboda, um, I think it's number three, um, although it's disappeared off my screen, was asking what the impact will be from Demos, was asking what the impact in Europe will be um, on the welfare state, welfare support, and the, the normal level of government spending for the basics of, of any community. And I'm paraphrasing here from memory as opposed to what he's physically written. Of, of the fiscal uh, cliff, or, or no? Um, forgive me, the network has gone down in here, which is why I can't read it here anymore. Uh, it, he was asking about whether the, 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 the pressure on, on uh, the fiscal pressure in Europe mm -hmm. will lead to a, really, a real impact now on welfare spending. Yes, I think the, that is almost inevitable. We have a, you know, a, a large number of countries that are still on a path to reducing their current deficits, and they, they, are not, they don't have a, really an alternative to that. The question is just you know, how quickly uh, this is done. It should not be done too quickly, um, uh, so there should be some backloading. But within that context, uh, it is clear that you know some of the it, it will not all it cannot only be done through increasing taxes, but also will have to exp affect expenditures. But you know, again, turning to a good news part of this is that um, you know some of the reforms that are being done in Europe, such as for instance increasing retirement age, well, that is actually acting both to you know 
to improve the long run problem of demographics that we have anyway, and the short run, uh, the short run okay. fiscal problem. So right. there are sometimes, you know, win win situations. Right. I can't ask you if you've got any questions because actually the network's gone down. So if you're sending emails or texts I, uh, or um, tweets, I can't actually read them. So let's move on to. I, I can see at the back someone does want to come in, but time is running running out if we're not careful. So Celine, thank you very much uh, for your patience. This is not to in any way diminish the importance of oceans. Um, but obviously, it was kind of difficult to push it in with youth unemployment and catastrophic risk and fiscal sustainability. So well, your well, pitch, please, on oceans risk. and the real dangers ahead. I actually think that we can make connections um, yes. with our oceans to all of our issues. Um, hopefully, there's an ocean at the bottom of your cliff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then you get a waterfall. It makes the, the fall a little softer. But I'd like to propose um, a challenge that we think of the ocean as our blue economy. Um, and it actually proposes a lot of possibilities that we are perhaps not looking at exploiting in a sustainable way. When we think of our oceans, we, we shouldn't just be thinking about environmental issues. It really is a, a human issue and a human challenge that we need to be thinking about. Um, I've, it's actually great that I'm going last because I've been, I've been listening to what everything um, everyone has been saying and what has been proposed, um, and I'd like to go back to something you said at the beginning, which is about our global community. We don't think like a global community. We think like individuals, and our development and our ever-growing globalization in a positive way has also created individuality and separation of thinking, where we need to think a lot more as a community and bringing these councils that we have here together rather than just following through with our own individual agendas. There is so much overlap in everything that I'm hearing that for me it's actually wonderful to, to hear all of this. What we have done with the, the Council on Oceans is, is really try to identify a couple of themes. Um, keep in mind that the oceans cover 71% 70, of our planet. Uh, a quarter of people depend on our oceans for food and about 44% of our global population lives within 100 kilometers of our oceans. So if you think you're not connected to our oceans, you are wrong. We are connected to our oceans in so many ways. We talk about youth employment, think about the blue economy. There are so many potential jobs and, and possibilities out there in terms of creating your own economy and your own work with the oceans in mind. We have, um, there's mining and obviously oil exploration, which if done in a sustainable and a responsible way, can be looked at as a job opportunity. Minerals are being discovered in, in deep sea beds um, as we speak, and um, there are ways to, to extract in sustainable ways. That is a new economy to be looked at. Our, our fishing um, is obviously an issue with overfishing happening and illegal fishing. That touches also on piracy, which touches on security issues. Um, because our oceans connect to all of our continents, we talk about piracy, we're talking about safety, we're talking about a global issue, not just an environmental issue. One concentration for us is to look at traceability. And I'll give you one example, which, which I learned of yesterday, which I was shocked about. Um, if you think about a yellowfin tuna that was fished in Hawaii, that yellowfin tuna gets shipped to Taiwan to be processed. It then comes back to the United States to be packaged and shipped back to Hawaii to be eaten, right? So that connection right there connects all of those continents. The label on that fish has t Taiwan as the origin, not Hawaii. So when you're, you're trying to eat local or you're trying to think in, in a local community or a global way, you're actually not as informed as you think you are because we don't have a system that allows us to trace that fish from bait to plate. So it's a simple way of saying that if we have the traceability methods of looking at our food system with our oceans, we're also touching on our international security, we're touching on the issues of transport because Let's face it, a lot of our transport happens on our oceans. We're talking about tourism as well, because a lot of our tourism happens on our coastal communities. When we talk about coastal communities, we're talking about development as well. So the oceans and traceability have become something that we are focusing on. We are also really wanting to get businesses engaged, because businesses um, are a huge factor as far as our oceans are concerned. And businesses are the future of our blue economy in terms of what we are going to be able to get from our oceans and how we're going to be able to share those resources. All of this has to happen, obviously, in an environmental and sustainable way, but our ocean topic is a human topic that connects 
every one of the nations. And if we can think in a more global, small community as far as that's concerned, I think we're really going to move forward in a positive way. We've created the Ocean Health Index. It was actually born um, out of the Council on Oceans and nurtured by the World Economic Forum, which is a metric to really look at 10 different goals, which includes food security, it includes livelihood and, and economy, um, it includes our natural resources, and, and seven more um, goals that I'll just stop there. Um, but that really allows us in a very simple way to look at a metric of the value of our oceans and each country has a value from 1 to 100. So there's room for improvement there, that's the positive side of this. There's many things that can be done and this is where the government really needs to get involved because the government involvement actually increases the overall score of that country's involvement in ocean issues. Thank you. Uh, what about the laws of the sea? And they're being tested very much when it comes to sovereign rights with islands and so on. Mm -hmm. But when you look at what's happening in the South China Sea and the various, mm -hmm. the various um, disputes there, plus what's happening in the Arctic where there is actually a deal, but also what's happening off Greenland and what's happening with the Arctic Council and the Arctic Treaties, and I just mentioned three or four there, what is your reflection on whether the laws of the ocean are resilient enough and proving their worth at the moment or not? My personal opinion is the laws of the ocean are not resilient enough, is that we need to have more stringent laws, we need to have more um, ways of reinforcing. And that's part of the problem. It's one thing to create laws, it's another thing to actually reinforce them and make sure that, that those are being abided by. Um, international waters are, are a point of contingency and, and a point of, of conflict, um, because who do they belong to and, and where do those resources go? And I think that we need to look that in more in depth. So what's your, ac more depth, uh, mm -hmm. well, so, so what, what's the action point there? It's all very well saying here in, 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 in Dubai, got, there's got to be mm -hmm. a cl greater, greater clarity. This kind of thing takes years to negotiate. Um, it does take years to negotiate, but I think as, as was reflected earlier, we don't have that time. Um, we, we feel that our oceans are this never-ending resource, but all we're really seeing, the majority of people, is the surface of the oceans. We're not seeing what's underneath it and the depletion that's happening. So those kinds of laws need to happen now, and agreements, international agreements, need to happen. And I know that that's a very complex theme, but this is what we're here for. Does anyone want to come in on oceans? Uh, please, at the back. Is this on oceans? Because I'm afraid the system has gone down, therefore I cannot... Um, if, you, if any of you are burning to ask about the sea, oceans, uh, fishing, and so on, I can't uh, raise those questions. They haven't come to me. At the back? No. All right. Let's, uh, in the last five minutes, open it up then. Does it, do uh, Charlotte or, or Beatrice or, or, or Valerie, do you want to come back on, particularly on this business of um, the sovereign rights of the sea? And this is something you're dealing with all the time, uh, Valerie Amos, at the United Nations, the issue of sovereignty and when it's an international issue, and when it's sovereign, stay out. Uh, yes, and it's not just in relation to the sea. I think what we are seeing increasingly, um, I mean, we need uh, more multilateralism, in my view, to sort out um, a number of issues that we face uh, in the world, and that includes some of these issues around uh, uh, the seas and oceans. But... Uh, conversely, what we are seeing is uh, a move in t back into uh, the nation state, greater protectionism, uh, countries basically saying this is uh, a sovereign issue for us uh, internally. And we're seeing this reflected politically in some of the debates uh, in the Security Council as well. So what we saw last year in terms of a debate around uh, Libya and how uh, and if the international community should uh, intervene to protect civilians is very different to the debate that we're having uh, this year with respect uh, to Syria uh, and precisely that same issue of uh, protection of civilians and so on. So um, I think that uh, there's a contradiction almost in terms of what the world needs but how the debate is being framed, uh, which is not necessarily helpful. Right, we've got four minutes left. Please, I can't see who it is. Who's got the microphone? Yes, uh, thank you. I'd like to come back to the... Could you just tell us who you are, please? Uh, Mike Hoden. I'm with the Aging Council. Uh, from New York, I'm going to go back and help with the fiscal cliff. But I would like to come back to this issue of fiscal sustainability and economic growth that was discussed a moment ago and suggest that here we are at the forum able to address that topic with a perfect kind of bridge on population aging. Mm. Mm. This is the 2 billion people over the age of 60, which gives the 21st century this 
profound demographic shift. Our policies, our institutions, our culture is still in a 20th century mode where we think of people in 60, 70, 80 as inactive, as unable to take care of themselves, as not part of economic activity and growth. That needs to shift and it will be a way to address both short-term fiscal challenges and more importantly, long-term economic viability. And so it is around this population aging topic that we need this profound shift in a culture thinking. The idea of a 60 or 70 or 80 year old in the 21st century being treated the way they were treated in terms of being brought into social and economic activity that was true perhaps in the 20th century is no longer the case. There is no better place to address this institutional change than the World Economic Forum. Charlotte, do you see a parallel challenge here? Your council is youth unemployment, but is it, is it, do you think, too narrow to be just considering youth unemployment? It should be the underemployed yes or the non-employed. No. Yes and no. I think it's too narrow for a group like this to, to only deal with. Uh, but I think it's too pressing and too important. And too, uh, Time is so, de so scarce. We really need to focus on youth employment because the problem is here right now. But I would like to say that also when we look at the statistics that we have to improve, we can also see that young people are the ones who don't get the jobs, while older people still get the jobs. So we really need for we need to do both, to kind of focus on youth unemployment because it's very pressing right now, but be more clever like a community here to integrate with others as well. Let me get one more intervention and then uh, we'll have to adjourn. Hi, good morning to you. My name is uh, Olia. I'm a senior editor in Al Bayan, Dubai official newspaper. For Valerie, you spoke about providing aids and you mentioned Syria and you said what can we do for countries when such governments prevent such aid I think yeah. don't you think it's time for a real reform for the UN Security Council that it's no longer five countries can control the future of this world thank you Nick can I just come in on that point because I think that uh, we talk very loosely about the United Nations and we forget that it's uh, 193 countries. It's not just the Security Council, it's not just the five uh, permanent members of the Security Council, there are another ten uh, that sit for a two-year term with those five members of the Security Council. So we become focused on the five members that have the veto, but actually the issue is much, much bigger and broader than that. Um, uh, uh, and I think that these issues that we've been talking about over the last couple of days in terms of uh, reform of the governance structures of our international uh, institutions is key, but there is a bigger responsibility piece here, which is uh, about the responsibility of each uh, leader and each country in terms of what they bring to that United Nations uh, discussion. And I think that we let countries off the hook if we focus just on the Security Council and the five permanent members. Great. Thank you, Valerie. Um, let's leave it there, I'm afraid, uh, because uh, we're out of time. It's been a very rich uh, hour and ten minutes. Thank you very much indeed for being here, getting here, uh, and also for contributing. My apologies, the system went down. Resilience isn't 100% on Wi-Fi. Can I just say, though, that there was one email, I think it was from Branca, who said the great thing, this shows improvement and what a meeting like this can do. Uh, two days ago, it was only men on the platform. This morning, <laughs> it's only women. <laughs> so thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.